At Maverick Public Relations, growing your influence is their specialty. NPR works with remarkable companies in the cannabis industry to deliver exceptional results. Experience big agency expertise and outstanding client service delivered by seasoned and knowledgeable experts. Connect with Maverick PR today and move your company to the next level. Visit them today at www.themaverickpr.com. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And Happy New Year. I know you've probably heard it a billion times by now, but this is the first opportunity for the Cannabis Podcast to wish you a Happy New Year. I hope it started off well for you. Let's hope that 2021 has a better ending than 2020 did. We have lots of room to get there. Uh, And speaking of lots of room, we got lots of room on today's episode to talk about a bunch of different things. One of the things that has cropped up in the last little while is the incredible inequities of the cannabis equivalency equations that Health Canada has come up with. We're going to talk about that. (laughs) Plus, we're also going to take a look at the price, and, and this was something that Jacqueline Pahoda raised last week or last episode. Jacqueline Pahoda, of course, the executive director of Acres. And she talked about when she thinks about edibles and the price of edibles, she thinks of it as the per gram price. Plus, there's a story that I want to uh, cover. It's from theconversation.com. And cannabis, the problem with defining products around THC content. We'll dive into that a little bit. I am doing a cultivar corner of this episode as well, and that is going to be from Indiva San Fernando Valley OG Kush is coming up on Cultivar Corner. Plus, we'll throw in a couple other things. All of that and more on episode 62 of the Cannabis Podcast. And it is pretty exciting for me today to talk about the new look of the Cannabis Podcast. If you saw the episode artwork, you see uh, some of the new look. Uh, Plus, it's kind of everywhere. Everywhere you may be getting your podcast, uh, whether it be on the Apple podcast app or Spotify, all of those visuals have been updated and there's a bit of a story to the update, as there always is. (laughs) You already know about my very talented son, Ian, who is the composer of the jingle for Cultivar Corner. He also does the voiceover for my introduction each and every episode. Does a fabulous job on that, but not only is he talented, he's married to a very talented graphic artist. Uh, My daughter-in-law, Christine, is the one responsible for the new bold look of the Cannabis Podcast. Gave me a new word mark, which I just absolutely love. It just pops every time I look at it. New color schemes, new new things to follow, new directions for various social media posts. It's it's a bit much for an old dude like me, (laughs) but I'll get through it. I'm just extremely excited about the new look. She did a fabulous job, and I'm I'm excited to, to be using it and incorporating it all into the program. So let me offer my biggest thank yous to my daughter-in-law, Christine. Thank you for the excellent effort, Christine. I love the end result. And since we just finished Christmas a little while ago, there seems to be an idea with people in my family that uh, cannabis-related gifts are appropriate. Where did they get that idea? It was another great year for that. In fact, it's a very small item, but one of the most popular ones. And by popular, I mean a lot of people have commented on it. And that is a little pin that I wear on my apron at work. And it came from my son, Ian, who, of course, you've heard me talk about a whole lot on this podcast. Ian gave me this little pin that is a a raw rolling tray. It's only like about, you know, an inch and a half wide. And it'd be pretty hard to actually roll the joint in it, but it's a pretty cool pin. So that was very cool. And then books seem to be a factor that that comes in a lot at Christmas. And and I I love it because some of them are just so, so cool. In fact, last year, uh, I received a book from Ian that was uh, Cannabis, the Canadian Weed Reader, 420 Things You Need to Know About Living the High Life. And let me read one of the quotes out of that. This is number 266. It's, It's always early and late early morning somewhere. I'll be honest with you. I used to smoke marijuana, but I could only smoke it in the late evening. Oh, occasionally the early evening or mid-evening, but that was it. The late evening, the early evening or mid-evening, but that was it. I, uh, oh, occasionally the early morning or or, or, the mid-morning, maybe the late morning or occasionally the early mid-late morning. 
or sometimes the mid-early morning, or, or all the late afternoon. Sometimes the mid-early late afternoon. Never at dusk. No, I would never smoke it at dusk. And that's a quote from Steve Martin, comedian, in the Cannabis, the Canadian Weed Reader. That was from last year. And this year, on the bookshelf, uh, this is probably a book that I think a lot of people got, because I know I was talking to uh, Sydney at work, and I think her brother got this as well. And that is Stoned Beyond Belief by Action Bronson. Big green book. (laughs) And I'm just going to read you the back cover of this one. Uh, This book has been a burden to write. This hasn't been an easy book to write. It's taken away from my high time. But this book is a big deal because weed changed my life. I get stoned beyond belief every single day of my life. But as you smoke and you smoke and you smoke, you build up a tolerance. And you're constantly searching for that old high school stoned. That's what I'm looking for. Your eyes really low, tearing up, almost shut. A big grin on your face. Eating chips, the chips falling all over you. Ashes on your shirt, just acting really silly. You're like the old cars with a pop-up headlight, where one of them is stuck halfway down. You want to feel like you lost your phone. Where's my phone? It's literally right next to you. That's the high I'm trying to find. That weed that's going to get me high like it did back then. That's stoned beyond belief. And that's a pretty good description of the book. It is just (laughs) full of all kinds of stuff, including a great recipe for grilled cheese sandwich. If you want to try that out, also not only a great recipe for it, but a fabulous picture of the melting cheese of your grilled cheese sandwich. (laughs) And then the last book I received this year at Christmas was actually from my wife. She ordered it from a local bookstore and they actually had to uh, order it because they had one in stock, but apparently someone lifted it before Christmas. And this is one of the, I have to say, one of the tiniest little books I've ever seen. But one of the advantages of it being tiny is it will actually fit in the pocket of my apron. (laughs) And here's why that's relevant, because the book is called Stuff Every Cannabiser Should Know. And it's written by a fellow by the name of Mark Luber. And I'm just going to read you the tag on the back of the book, because it kind of says a lot about who Mark is and references the tiny book. Mark Luber is the husband and father from Pennsylvania, He's come to understand the many benefits of cannabis and hopes to help others do the same one tiny book at a time. And so stuff every cannabis, every cannabis sir should know is rife with all kinds of things on the effects of using cannabis, THC versus CBD, how to roll a joint. Not that I need instruction for that, but sometimes it's a good refresher. How to throw a weed party. And let me read you just a piece of this that is how to store your pot. A perfectly cured bud can last up to two years under ideal conditions. Improperly stored weed can lose potency and cannabinoid content. Maximize the potency and shelf life of your marijuana with these tips. And I'll just read you a few of these. Storage dues. Keep your marijuana in an airtight glass mason jar. These are available online at craft stores or anywhere that sells kitchen supplies. Store your mason jar in a cool and dark place. Avoid sunlight. And keep your jar in an environment that has a temperature below 75 degrees. Stoves or other heat sources are your herb's enemy. And I'll stop it at that. So if you want to check out the rest of that, that is Mark Luber. And I'll try to find links to each of the books that I have put out and post those back at CannabisPodcast.com. So that was some of the fun of Christmas. Uh, Some of the fun that I've experienced recently uh, at work. And this kind of said to me that stigma is still out there. Despite how bold we all are at, at going shopping at the various cannabis stores, consuming and purchasing our cannabis. I had a lady in the store the other day and as she was going to leave, I think she bought three eights. And as she was going to leave, I asked if she wanted a bag and initially she said no, but then she said, oh, no, I will take a bag because there's some cops in the parking lot. <laughs> I was I was just kind of stunned. And I said, well, you you do know it's legal, right? I said, I know, but it, but it still feels weird to to walk out of the store with pot and, and look at the cops sitting in their car. So there is still a touch of stigma involved. And then the other thing that I got uh, kind of hit with just uh, yesterday, in fact, uh, was dealing with a customer and she had, uh, I think, purchased an eighth of something. And it's and then she said, well, despite the advice of a well-known podcaster that buying pre-rolls may not be the best economic use of my cannabis money, I'd like to buy some pre-rolls. 
And then she looked at me with a big smile on her face and I realized exactly what she was talking about. It was an episode I had done a couple episodes ago talking about pre-rolls and how they are not your best value for your cannabis dollar. <laughs> so kudos to you for being a listener. Thank you for coming along for the ride. It's always kind of cool, as, as you well know. I, I love it when people point it out because it just makes me realize that there are people out there listening and it's not just me sitting here in my studio all alone talking to absolutely no one. That's some of the things I wanted to share with you this week. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Call of Our Corner today, we are looking at another indica. Well, actually, no, that's not true. <laughs> You know, you know what's going to be interesting when you start off and you're wrong right from the very first words. This is actually a hybrid. And what we're trying today is from a company called Indiva, which is very close to Indica. Indiva, they're doing a whole bunch of products. And in fact, the one we're going to look at today is their SFE OG Kush, San Fernando Valley OG Kush, done by a number of different companies out there. And this is Indiva's, Indiva's, so it's I-N-D-I-V-A, uh, their version of SFE OG Kush. And I'm impressed by a couple of things. First of all, oh, marvelous aromas coming out of this. Oh, very fruity. And, and a hint of green apple. And the hint of green apple is coming from an interesting terpene, Farnesine. The other nice thing about Indiva's SFE OG Kush is they literally are putting on the label. Yes, we're finally getting there. They're putting on the label the actual terpenes that are in this particular product. And the terpenes come out at 3.60% of the overall volume of the cannabis inside this little jar. 3.6% terpenes. That's fabulous. And the terpenes that are included, well, first of all, let's, let me give you the THC value. So on San Fernando Valley OG Kush, the total THC is sitting at 24.7%. And when we look at the terpenes, I've got limonene at 1.46 cents, 1.46 percent. I've got farnesine at 0.49 percent, myrcene at 0.36 percent, and other terpenes which could be any one of about another 20 terpenes, and that's adding up to 1.29%. So it's really interesting that they're starting to put the terpenes literally on the labels to give us a sense of, of what is inside. And as I say, when I, oh, take that first hint of the aroma on this, ah, a lot of sweetness, and definitely there is that hint of green apples, and that apparently comes from the farnesine. Uh, farnesine, not one we've heard a lot about, but if you're smelling that green apple scent in any of your cannabis, chances are there is some farnesine in there. So let's examine the buds. Now, they weren't huge. I have to be really honest. They, the, the container was a full weight, so it was not under. In fact, I think it was about 3.6. might have even been 3.6. But it achieved that with really small popcorn buds. <laughs> I mean, these guys are really, really tiny. Uh, which is fine. I, I, as, as you know from listening to the podcast, I'm not a huge believer in you have to have big buds to get good weed or to get a good high. It can all come from these small popcorn buds as well. And that's what we're going to find out today because we are looking at a significant amount of popcorn buds sitting in here in this jar of mm, very sweet smelling with that hint of green apple from Sir San Fernando Valley OG Kush. And it is a cross between, surprisingly enough, San Fernando Valley OG and Afghani Kush. So now we got both sides of this arrangement. This indica dominant hybrid has high THC and terpene potency with heavy citrus, earthy, and fruity notes with a hint of green apple. And that's that farnesine, which we spoke about already. Well, you'll be impressed. Uh, I have already gotten ready. <laughs> I don't need to stop to roll the joint or prepare the. A vaporizer, because in fact, it's all ready to go. So here we go. This is Invita San Fernando Valley OG Kush. And also in a bit of a prep, this is the first uh, smoke I've had today. So this is going to be a real good example of how this works as an indica hybrid. Kick off one of my first days off in a while. 
and looking to enjoy it. And we're going to enjoy it with this one, San Fernando Valley, O.G. Kush. There's a little of that citrus, and those fruity notes that come through with the flower. Hmm. Pleasant taste. Not picking up any hint of the green apple in the actual smoke. And there we are, two good hits off of San Fernando Valley OG Kush. And he starts to wait for some signs of intoxication. <laughs> Always nice when it's my first hit of the day, too, because then I get a real true idea of how this particular smoke is going to work in most instances. And here we go. Ah, there's that, there's that feeling that I just love, that feeling that says, I'm high and I love being high and, and I've achieved it after three hits. Let's roll in number four. Again, not much of the, of the fruity notes in terms of the smoke. Let's pick up the vaporizer and let's see if I'm picking up any more of those fruity tones and any of that citrus. So here's the first hit of the vaporizer. Oh, yeah. Much more. Mm. Much more on the fruitiness. And even a hint of the green apple. It's a pleasant taste. Pleasant odor. Hitting me pretty good. And I don't... <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out the particular strains or the particular terpenes <coughs> that give me those happy eyes that I'm always so anxious to find. I got a hint of it right now, but it's just kind of a laid back kind of happy eyes. I can, can kind of feel it, <laughs> but it's not hitting really hard. Not in the happy eyes perspective anyways, but the rest of the high is pretty good. We have San Fernando Valley OG Kush from a couple of different uh, growers. We have Simply Bear and uh, this one from Indiva. And I think I might have been pronouncing it wrong all the time. I might have been saying Invita, but it's Indiva. If I have been saying Invita, wrong, 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 Gary. This is Indiva's San Fernando Valley OG Kush. You know, this is one instance where getting a little high brings you back to perspective and you start to get things correct. <laughs> So my buddy Jay back in Ontario was a little disappointed that I didn't do a cultivar corner in the last episode. So this is one to get back into sync. And I would say that in terms of the indica dominant hybrid, yeah, this is one that's a bit of a creeper. I can feel it's becoming more substantive as I kind of sit here in the studio waiting for things to, to occur and kind of plotting out the next parts of the podcast. Ah, <sighs> yeah, there's that nice body high from San Fernando Valley OG Kush. Not a lot of happy eyes, but still a bit of euphoria. Still some pretty good feelings going on. Uh, smooth smoke. Uh, didn't see any black uh, happening on my joint. The ash was pretty clean. Smoking it through the vaporizer gives you those, those nice fruity tones that we were talking about. Some of that limonene coming through with the citrus. And just a, just a hint of green apple from that pharnacine. Yeah, I would say if you're looking for a good indica dominant hybrid that's not going to knock you on your butt, but it's going to give you a pretty good high and a little bit of happy eyes as well, then Indiva's San Fernando Valley OG Kush is certainly worth a smoke. And I realized that I needed to do an update after I had sat with this for a while, and this really was a creeper. It, it kept building and building and building, and probably, uh, oh, I don't know, inside of five or ten minutes of taking those initial hits it turned into a real nice high. So, is a bit of a creeper. Still, my recommendations are that it's worth your time. Just give yourself a bit of time before you smoke all of it, because you may not need it all. <laughs> uh, and it's definitely a creeper, and it's given me a really good high. Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show, Lift & Co Expo. 
coming this May 12 to 15 to Metro Toronto Convention Center. Level up your industry intel at the Lyft Cannabis Business Conference. Connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from 250 plus exhibitors. Plus, everyone loves Lyft and Co. Expo's prizes, live music, and more. Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. And now it's time for me to jump on my soapbox one more time because as each day goes by, I realize more and more the absurdity of the equivalency rules that Health Canada has put in place with cannabis legalization. Now, the equivalencies that I'm speaking about are they, they have come out with certain guidelines that state, for example, uh, if you have a drink that has two milligrams of THC in it, uh, that classifies as being exactly the same as five grams of dried cannabis. How they come up with that formula, I have no idea because the math just doesn't make sense. And here's why the math doesn't make sense. That's if you buy drinks. So in other words, any cannabis retailer in the country can only allow you to purchase five drinks at a time because that comes out to 30 grams of THC. So you therefore can't buy a six pack of drinks simply because of the equivalency rules. I had a purchase made in the last couple of weeks that really to me solidified the absurdity of, of these equivalencies. So that's what happens when you have a drink that has two milligrams of THC at five, considered to be five grams of dried cannabis. Absurd. But here's where it really becomes absurd. When you look at the powders, you can buy a THC in a powder, has 10 milligrams of THC. And I had a gentleman come in and he wanted to buy just a whack of these. And he was curious how much he could actually buy before he was limited by the equivalency rules. <laughs> well, we tried it out. We, we put 24 packages of 10 milligrams of THC. And that came out to equivalency. Are you ready? <laughs> Take a guess yourself. Just, just, just take a guess how much you think 24 packages of 10 milligrams of THC would be in an in equivalency. I'll let you ponder that for a moment. 0.72 of a gram. That's what the equivalency was. <laughs> <laughs> and and if that doesn't show the absurdity of the equivalency rules, then I don't know what does. And then in the last episode, Jacqueline Pahota, the executive director of Acres, the Association of Canadian Cannabis Retailers, raised the whole concept uh, to us about the price of edibles and how she thinks of it in a different perspective. And I thought it was really intriguing. And so, I mean, just a quick little bit, but let's work out the price. So average price of a 10 milligram edible starts at about $5.99. That would be for a cookie or, you know, something like that. And now let's take that to up to 100 of those, which would get us to a thousand milligrams, which is a gram. $599 a gram is what you're paying for your edibles. At least that's, that's the way my math works. If you are a mathematician and, and see some error in my calculation, then let me know. But I just simply took five ninety nine, having ten milligrams of THC in it, multiplying that by one hundred, which would get me one thousand milligrams, which would be a gram, right? Five hundred and ninety nine dollars. <laughs> mm. Now that I think about it, maybe pre rolls is not such a bad use of your cannabis dollars. And now to the story about cannabis and the problem with defining products around THC content. And this is a story from theconversation.com. Cannabis policy is undergoing a global revolution. Around the world, laws are changing. In the U.S., there are now 15 states in which cannabis for adult use purposes is legal, and nearly three dozen where it is legal for medical purposes. In 2018, of course, Canada became the first G7 country to legalize cannabis for all purposes following the first country to do so, Uruguay. More than 40 countries on every continent except Antarctica have implemented a legal framework for cannabis primarily for medical purposes. In the UK, consumption of cannabis and cultivation, production, and distribution that is unlicensed for non-medical or non-industrial purposes is still illegal, subject to a warning 
or a fine of 90 pounds. Penalties for possession and supply production range from 5 to 14 years in jail. Unlimited fines for both. The CBD market. Although medical cannabis access is restricted, there is another popular legal cannabis market where over-the-counter cannabis-based products are available. They're predominantly made up of a cannabinoid called cannabidiol, commonly referred to as CBD, which, as an isolated compound, is legal in the UK. One way CBD is defined is by its THC, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol content. THC is one of the most widely studied and well-known cannabis compounds, a principal chemical in the plant that people associate with getting high. THC, for non-medical purposes, is illegal in the UK, and CBD products must contain less than 0.2% THC and less than 1 milligram of THC per product, i.e. very, very small levels. Consumers buy CBD for chronic pain, anxiety, and inflammatory-related issues, as well as sleep, metabolism, pleasure, and mood. Name your need. From sex to sleep, relief to recovery, focus to fitness, and skin health to gut health, there likely is a CBD product that claims to sort it. And currently, the UK CBD market value is around $300 million. THC versus CBD Out of the 400-plus chemical compounds in the cannabis plant, CBD and THC are only the most well-known and researched cannabinoids. Both are psychoactive substances, but the THC is psychotropic and CBD is non-psychotropic. And just as an aside, I love that particular explanation between THC and CBD because it's a constant battle about so many people and companies claim that CBD is non-psychoactive. It is. It is non-psychotropic. Thank you very much, conversation.com. Psychoactive effects are a daily experience to most. No matter how you take your coffee, know that it includes a dose of psychoactivity. Morning caffeine jitters and post-coffee highs are such symptomatic effects. Chocolate lovers will also have experienced psychoactive effects such as improved mood, stress reduction, and focus. Psychotropic effects, by contrast, are what people stereotypically identify with the high of cannabis. There might be mood and mind-altering effects, which change behavior, thoughts, perception, and mental and motor activity. Many of the laws around cannabis, both in the UK and elsewhere, cling on to this distinction between psychoactive and psychotropic compounds as an easy way to distinguish between beneficial and harmful substances. But the synergy of THC and CBD and other cannabinoids like THCV, CBN, CBG, and Delta-8 THC are under investigation by scientists to explore how multiple compounds enhance the potential effect of the plant. This characterizes a theory called the entourage effect, which we, of course, have spoken a lot about here on the Cannabis Podcast. And the entourage effect suggests that the synergy of various molecules found in cannabis when combined maximizes potential efficacy of a whole plant compound rather than isolated extracts. Very interesting article from theconversation.com. And in fact, let's look at another story that's somewhat related because it's talking about at the heart of the plant, what is it that we get so excited about? This is our from our friends at Mr. Stinky's Green Garden. Cannabis Resin Explained. The gooey, almost glue-like quality of some top-shelf examples of cannabis is the result of a substance called resin. Resin, while a single component of cannabis, is comprised of many medical molecules, including the most important cannabinoids and terpenes. Cannabinoids are the chemical components that are responsible for the psychoactive well, actually, we just learned that they are responsible for the psychotropic effect and much of the plant's medical efficacy. They are editing on the fly. Terpenes are equally medicinal, but are also responsible for the infamous and sometimes intense odor of cannabis. The most famous molecule in cannabis, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, is a cannabinoid. Cannabidiol, CBD, is another example of a medicinal cannabinoid, albeit one that doesn't deliver a euphoric high because it is non-psychotropic. See, we're intermixing the two stories. Terpenes, like cannabinoids, do everything from fight cancer to alleviate depression to reduce or eliminate seizures in epileptic children. Examples include myrcene, which smells musky and is the most common terpene in cannabis, limonene, which conveys an aroma of citrus, and pinene, which smells like a walk through a pine forest. There's more to the story of cannabis resin, however. 
Resin is produced by special nearly microscopic secretory glands on the flowers and sugar leaves of the plant called trichomes. These glands also appear on the fan leaves, stalk, and branches of the plant, but in far fewer numbers. There are actually six different varieties of trichomes, all of which serve slightly different functions. The largest of these siblings, and thus the type that produces the most cannabinoids and terpenes, is the capitate stalked variety. At 50 to 100 millimeters wide, it is the biggest and most industrious of the trichomes. In cannabis cultivation, growers know their plants are near harvest when the trichomes begin to transition from clear to a cloudy, almost milky, light red or orange. The small size of trichomes means that such inspections require a jeweler's loop or even a microscope. From an evolutionary perspective, botanists believe that resin was developed by the cannabis plant as a defense mechanism against insects and animals. The bitter taste and potent aroma of resin protect the precious flowers of the plant, but you're hoping to find some pollen that floats by in order to become inseminated and propagate the species before being eaten by a pest. From the perspective of humans, resin blocks UV sunlight, helping protect the delicate terpenes and cannabinoids contained within so they can do things like shrink cancer tumors and lift depression in patients. Once again, nice article from Mr. Stinky's Garden, although perhaps let's correct the idea of it being uh, psychoactive and, and psychotropic now that we have clearly identified those differences. I want to follow up with another follow-up. You may remember back in episode 50, David Wiley and I talked about the problems he had in accessing medical marijuana with the current state of legalization. And we've heard stories from others that have experienced similar problems. I always appreciate it when listeners contribute to the content of what we're trying to do here. And I'm especially thankful to Jean-Sebastien from Quebec, who is a recent listener jumping on board. He's now going through all of the different episodes. And as a result of him listening to episode 50, he is presenting a different perspective on medical access, at least from his experience in Quebec. So Jean-Sebastien had no trouble at all getting a prescription and getting registered with a distributor. Now, he calls it a distributor instead of an LP because it's a delivery-only service that holds some products from a couple of different LPs in stock, namely the Green Organic Dutchman, Believe, Montreal Cannabis, and Tremblant Cannabis. The process for JS was extremely quick. He sent an email to the website in question. Within 72 hours, he received a call back asking for a couple more details. Within an hour from that first call, he received another phone call, this time from a medical clinic to set up a Skype meeting, which ended up being about three days later. And then after the meeting with the practitioner, he was able to order his medical cannabis the very next day, not even a full 24 hours later. And within that very same day, he received his first order of medical cannabis, which was San Fernando Valley, interestingly enough, just what we talked about today, CBD Godbud, an indica dominant hybrid, and a one gram pre roll of maize haze from Believe. And he says that all of them were very excellent products. So thank you very much, JS, for giving us another perspective on what's happening when you are trying to access medical cannabis in our country. I am excited about the next episode of the Cannabis Podcast. As you know, I always appreciate it when interviews come to me, when people contact me and, and request to talk about a certain product or a certain company. And such an event happened over the last couple of weeks, and I want to thank Victoria Decker for setting all this up. Victoria connected me with a fellow by the name of Tanner Stewart. Tanner Stewart is with Stewart Farms, and their approach to production and commercialization is a lot different than most LPs. They're focused on sustainability and regenerative practices. And you'll get a perspective next week of how difficult that word can sometimes be to say. The company's CEO is Tanner Stewart. And Tanner has some really strong opinions on the current state of environmental responsibility in the industry and a lot of other things in the industry, in fact. That conversation will be our feature conversation next episode. As always, if you have any comments about anything that you hear on the episodes, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. You will find the links to everything we talked about as well back at CannabisPodcast.com. And that wraps it up for episode 62 with a new look of the Cannabis Podcast. From the cannabis-infused studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast.